Okay, so you would say, Nigel, Mr Casey, that by the 11th of August it was clear that the position of the British Embassy in Wazir Akbar Khan in central Kabul was no longer a viable option and that the sensible thing to do was to move the embassy complete to the well, airhead. The, the, uh, the judgment that I'd, I'd had to make, Chair, and, and put advice to, to Sir Philip uh, on every week since June had been whether we could fulfil our duty of care, which is that in, in, in reasonably foreseeable circumstances, could we keep our staff safe and could they do their jobs? And by the 11th of August, I concluded that was no longer possible operating from inside the green zone and we needed to relocate. Okay. And, Sir so Philip, the, the embassy was, by this point, about 75 strong. That's correct? Uh, that's, that's correct, yes. Uh, would that make it one of the larger or smaller British missions around the world? At, at 75 UK staff, there would have been additional Afghan country-based colleagues. It would have been a, a medium, to, medium to large. It's quite a considerable number. Obviously, it had been much larger. We'd, we'd already taken a decision uh, earlier on, given the increasing risk in, in Kabul, to bring the numbers down and to really prioritise the work around the highest priority national security work on the one hand and the work on, on the Arab scheme to, uh, to bring people to the UK uh, as we accelerated that programme. Those were the two main focuses that, that Laurie uh, and the team had. And then as, as, as Nigel has set up, we then came down from 75 to 20 as we, as we chose to move uh, to, to the airport to be more secure. Okay, but you'd, you'd say that even on the 11th of August it was still a significant mission and presumably for you on the 11th of August, the prime focus of your duty of care responsibilities around the world? Uh, I think that was probably the riskiest place. We had that sort of size of, of people, and we do have other parts of the world, you know, Somalia, Libya, other, other places where, you know, colleagues work in, in dangerous and difficult circumstances, and we... But if you were to do a risk... attention to our duty of care, but yes, Kabul, Afghanistan was the, the top of the list. Right. So Kabul was the top of the list. On the 11th of August, the embassy was moving. On the 13th, it was clear that the military could no longer hold. And on the 15th, um, the president fled the country. That, that would be a correct summary of those few days, would it? <coughs> uh, what day did you return from holidays, Philip? So I'm, I'm happy to go into dates uh, in a minute, Chair, but let me just say before I do that, I mean, I have uh, reflected uh, a lot uh, since August on, uh, on my leave, and if I had my time again, uh, I would have come back from my leave earlier, earlier than I did. I did put in place, uh, as I think you know, cover arrangements, both an acting permanent secretary in a normal way, but also a, a director general to lead uh, in parallel on Afghanistan work and I stayed in touch with uh, the department all the way through the period uh, closely um, through, uh, through August. But as I say, uh, you know, I do, if I had my time again, I would have come back from my leave earlier. Okay, well look, I, I think we welcome the candour with which you expressed that. It, it does still remain a concern that the Foreign Secretary was on leave and you'll remember the session that he had before this committee in September. Um, it, it does struck, strike this committee certainly as strange that while the Foreign Secretary did come back eventually, um, you decided not to. As I say, Chair, you know, I've reflected on that and if I had my time again I would have come back from my leave earlier. Okay, what day did you actually come back? Uh, I came back on the um, 26th of August. And where were you? I don't really want to go into... into okay, uh, let me ask the question differently. Were you in the United Kingdom? I was partly in the United Kingdom, partly not. Okay. Um, Have you ever changed your holiday plans in a crisis before? Uh, I have, yes. Yeah. W would you consider it normal for staff to do so? Uh, Chair, as I say, I'm, yeah, I'm at risk of repeating myself. I have reflected on this. There's a lesson for me in all of this which I, I accept, and if I had my time again, I would have come back. Uh, I would have come back earlier. May I ask, going back to the first question I asked you, do you consider yourself a Crown servant or a civil servant? Uh, I'm, I'm both, I'm, you know, formerly I'm a civil servant, a member of the diplomatic service, and a civil servant. Um, you know, Crown service is, uh, is, a, is a, wider, a wider term, but I think civil servant service a legal thing, a legal, also Crown, Crown service in that we work, you know, through the, through the government today for, uh, for Her Majesty, as all civil servants do. Okay. Um, Alicia, you wanted to come in quickly. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't think it's enough to say mea culpa. Um, 
how in two weeks at no point did you go this I can't I have to go in and protect my people because it would take me to the question of what how would you define duty of care you said just now we pay a particular focus to duty of care is that just a staff at post because what about the staff sat in the crisis center so I'm, I'm risk repeating myself. I have reflected on this, and if I had my time again, I would have come come back. But I did put in place senior cover, both an acting permanent secretary and a, uh, a director general who was clearly going to be there and available to lead our, uh, our Afghan work. I made sure that we had the systems plate going back uh, going back months, and Nigel's already referred. I was very closely involved as as the situation of our colleagues in Kabul became more more dangerous putting in place a system, firstly, of, of weekly reporting to me. We then brought it down to more, more frequent reporting uh, as the situation became more, more acute. I was confident that we had a system in place to discharge our duty of care. So on that, how... I struggle, and I should disclose I've worked in the crisis centre as a Foreign Office member of staff. How... This was a catastrophe... This was not all the other things going on that we'd like to say, oh, well, there are lots of other things going on. This was a catastrophe of incomparable nature that Mr Marshall set out in his evidence issues around no staff being conscripted properly into the crisis centre, no linguists, no computers, no access proper for visitors, no night shift system. Do you therefore think that those you put in place to take your role in your absence failed at their duties? Uh, so let me come on to giving you... Uh, you've mentioned uh, Michelle Marshall and you know, we saw the, uh, the witness statement he's given. So I take uh, the issues he's raised very seriously indeed. He, he emailed me uh, on the 31st uh, of August. He'd spent four days uh, as a member of the crisis uh, team and he, he said in that email uh, that A, he was uh, going to share information with this this committee, which I think he, he, he had already done at that point, uh, and also said that the, uh, the civil service code had been, been breached. Uh, I asked to see him and did indeed see him later that day, given the, the serious nature of, of what he had, had said, uh, and I set out for him uh, a, his, his options in raising, raising concerns uh, and B, that we cooperate with this yeah, with this committee and any inquiry you would something we have, and I was confident, I think, Chair, you may already at that point have, have said there would be an inquiry, and we would cooperate with the inquiry, and we would also, as we always do in the department, carry out the lessons uh, learning exercise. Uh, we stayed in touch with him, and I, I decided that we should, uh, given his genuinely held concerns, uh, treat him as a, a whistleblower under the former whistleblowing procedures, I used those to appoint a, a senior uh, former head of mission who had not been involved at all in the Afghan crisis to look into his concerns, to talk to him, but also those involved in the crisis uh, response. And she, she did that, and she found no evidence that the Civil Service Code uh, had been breached. Uh, and she acknowledged that staff working under huge pressure had done their best to deliver the right outcomes. So that takes now, back she, to my she, also made, she also made some... I apologise, Philip, but that takes you back to my original question, which is, did those who, in your absence, had to step up fail then? No, I don't think they did fail. Uh, as I said, <laughs> by the beginning of this session, it was an extremely complex and difficult uh, crisis. Uh, we did, um, enabled by the, the military on the ground very bravely, uh, making sure that it was uh, secure enough in Kabul, led... Uh, in difficult circumstances by, by, by Solori, uh, managed to evacuate 15,000 people. I do acknowledge there were things that we could have done better and we all wish we could have got more people out and there are, I'm sure, lessons we can learn. I'm going to come back to the structural problems much later. Um, did you ever visit the crisis centre at any point? Uh, yes, I did. I visited the crisis centre when, when I was in London. As soon as I was back, I was in the crisis centre. I've been a regular visitor to the crisis centre. I also kept in touch with those leading the crisis. Well, will you send us the dates of those visits, please? Oh. Because I'm not aware of any visits that have been recorded. And Mr Casey, can I ask how often you visited the crisis centre? I, w I was there every day. I was uh, acting as gold crisis, so I was sitting in the crisis centre throughout. That's interesting, again, because I would say that Mr Marshall, while he had to point out that he doesn't actually know what you look like, Mr Casey, 
um, which is surprising if you were gripping the crisis centre that a civil servant wouldn't have any idea, because I'd like to point out the crisis centre is very small. I've spent many hours in it. So, so um, let me just say a little bit about how our crisis system works. So what, what you can't do when you're, we responded 24-7, we ended up, I think, as the Foreign Secretary took you through when you gave evidence with you know, 500 people plus working in a 24-hour in a period. You, you can't rely on a single individual to be the, the gold crisis le leader. So Nigel had the, the primary role, but there was a rotor of, of goals and making sure that we had 24-7 cover, including at the leadership level of our crisis response. But surely, if a leader is gripping, the people in that room should know who those leaders are. I think people did know who, who Nigel was. I think people did know who the golds uh, the golds were. I, I don't think anyone can be there 24-7. Final question for me, Chex, and whether others. If this isn't what failure looks like, and I will come on to the specifics of why I think the civil service crisis system clearly failed in this, what does failure look like? As I say, we successfully evacuated 15,000 people. No, I'm we sorry, wish, this isn't about the headline stats. This is about the system, the bureaucratic civil service system that should be running a proper crisis centre, fully staffed, to the levels that needed. Mr Casey, you said this, I'm uh, sorry, pardon me, uh, Sir Bristow, you said this was a scenario we envisaged and planned for. So if this isn't failure, what is? So we, 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 we declared a crisis. <coughs> We went through the uh, through the gears in putting more people in. We ended up with 500 plus. We had more than a thousand people. Where were the 500, please? So some of them in the crisis centre. Some of them were were working uh, working elsewhere. Some of them were working in our in our network. And where is elsewhere? Well, some of them could have been working from home. And so the point is that you know you can't, particularly during a COVID, COVID time, have 500 people working in one uh, in one space. It's about the, yeah what they're able what they're able to deliver. I'll leave it there for now. Um, Stuart, do you Thank you, right Chairman. Now? Apologies to members and to our witnesses for being late for the uh, beginning of the hearing. Um, Sir Philip, can I take you back to the issue of holidays? Um, you know, we've the committee has found it incredibly difficult uh, to get any kind of information or accountability from the department, and in particular the former foreign secretary as to what he was up to, who he was talking to, what he was discussing, as the Taliban was advancing across Afghanistan towards Kabul. When did the Foreign Secretary go on holiday? What date did he leave the country? Uh, I'm not sure I have that date uh, in front of me. I think on the Foreign Secretary's holiday, you know, he, he dealt with that in... Never told us the date. He, he, he dealt with his holiday and his evidence. No, he didn't, to, I'm afraid. To, I'm afraid he didn't. He, he, he did his usual uh, bluster. He accused me of a political fishing expedition. But what I'm actually interested in here, Sir Philip, is accountability. And it's a matter of public record. When the Taliban was taking various towns and provinces across the country, what I would like to do is match the dates that they were taking over various parts of the country with his call logs and who he was talking to when he was talking to them. And as a part of that, I'll be honest with you, when I asked him when he went on holiday, I thought he'd just give me a date and we'd move on to the next question. But he refuses to say the date himself. Now, the general consensus seems to be it was on or around the 4th of August. Would you recognise that date? I, I, d I don't have the dates in front of me, and I'm not going to speak for the previous foreign secretary. No, but you, the department would know when its secretary of state left the country, no? That so, wouldn't say, be an unusual thing for, for the head of the, the department to know. As I say, I don't have the date in front of me, and I'm not going to speak for the previous Foreign Secretary. I'm not asking you to speak for the previous Foreign Secretary. Does the date exist somewhere in the Foreign Office that you can go back after this meeting, get it, and send the date to the committee? I'm, I'm happy to take that question away. So it does exist? There's a, there's a system for ministerial cover, and I'm happy to take away the question that you asked me. So the system for ministerial cover will contain the date the Foreign Secretary left, presumably, and you'll share that with the committee? Yes, I'm happy to take it away. It, what does that mean? I'm happy to look at, yeah, look at the information we hold and consult the previous Foreign Secretary. Well, he won't want you to tell me because he didn't tell, him, tell the committee himself. Uh, is there a reason why we can't get the date? I mean, we know he was at the country, we know where he was, we know all this stuff about a beach being closed. Why can we not just get the date he left the country? 
Well, I'm, I'm happy to take that away and uh, consult the previous ones. You look delighted uh, to take it away, Sir Philip. Can I come to the call logs? Because I've submitted some written questions uh, looking to find out, as I say, on the dates that the Taliban was advancing in key cities and provinces in part of the country to kind of map that beside who the Foreign Secretary was talking to and when. Can we get the call logs of who he spoke to? I'm, 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 on key I, dates. I thought that we had written already, the, one, the previous one had already written to the committee about who was in contact with whom. Uh, well, you, I think we did, we did share uh, a, long, a long list. I don't know, Nigel, whether you can... I think a long list of women that are in touch with which, uh, which foreign countries all the way through. Well, we, through we, never, seem, we never seem to get the, the proper black and white detail. I, I'm in particular interested in the, foreign, the then Foreign Secretary's phone calls. I've had some information about Lord Ahmed and, and uh, Lord Goldsmith, but I want to know who the Foreign Secretary was speaking to, not because I'm on a political fishing expedition, but because I think accountability matters. I know that's unfashionable uh, with ministers uh, at the moment. But I think it does matter, and it matters to this committee. So can we get the full August call logs for the former Foreign Secretary and the date that he went on holiday? So, uh, you know, unless Nigel wants to come in, I think we did write, and the former Foreign Secretary did write to the committee about, yeah. about who was talking to, to him. But Nigel, do you want to add anything on this? Yes, just to confirm, the, the, following your questions, uh, at, the last, at his, his uh, uh, oral uh, testimony session, he wrote on the 15th of September um, with a number of answers to, 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 to some of your questions that he promised um, attaching a table of all the, uh, the calls and meetings and other interventions at his level and by other ministers in the, in the relevant period. Just, um, I'm, I'll, I'll bring this to a close because I'm conscious other members want to come in. Um, Nigel, do you know when the Foreign Secretary went on holiday? I don't, I don't know the exact date, he's the honest answer, no. And just lastly, do you, when did the Foreign Secretary in, in July or August speak to Secretary Blinken or the Secretary General of NATO? I don't have that in front of me. Can we get that? We can look at it if it wasn't in the letter that Nigel's talked about. That wasn't. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Bob, you wanted to come in. Uh, thank you. May I um, ask you some questions about Raphael Marshall's comments and the evidence that he's given us, which I'm sure you've probably had a good look at in the newspapers and elsewhere today. Um, do you think his comments are fair, as he does make some fairly strong allegations? So, as I said, his central, uh, central point that he made, uh, that we looked at, uh, was that there had been a breach uh, of the Civil Service Code, and as I, I said earlier, in, in answer to an earlier question from, from Alicia, uh, a very senior uh, uh, diplomat who had not been involved at all, looked at that and found no, no breach of the Civil Service Code. She did point to some some issues, but she did say very clearly that under huge pressure, uh, people have done their very best to deliver, uh, deliver outcomes around, around the evacuation. I think overall, I think some of the things he say are the sorts of things we'll look at in, in our lessons learning, other things I don't think are fair. Okay, parking the, 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 the breach of the code, he, he makes some quite telling criticisms on individual and specific things. 